Hello and welcome to my channel, bonsoir et bienvenue sur ma chaîne, my name is Muriel and this evening I will be doing a dual review for The Thargo Wood and Le Vendis by Robert Holtstock. Yes, a dual review since Le Vendis is technically a sequel to Mythargo Wood. Both of them are in fact part of a series which includes, I think, five or six books in total. I only read these two because they're published in the Fantasy Masterworks series and I wanted to review them together because thematically, narratively, they're fairly similar. So it's not quite a series review, it's a dual review. So, the basic premise of Mythago Wood and then Lavondis is that in the English countryside, between Hertfordshire and Kent, lies a forest called Ryehope Wood. It also has other names. And this forest has a very peculiar phenomenon attached to it, is that it manifests archetypes, mythical figures present in humans collective and conscious. It's not really a spoiler, don't worry, I mean, it won't ruin the story of the books. That's the premise. In Mythago Wood you have Stephen Huxley who comes back from the Second World War front to his family house in the country and his dad has been obsessed with this Ryehope Wood for years and years and he dies and then his brother picks up this obsession and there's a woman involved and so he's confronted with analyzing the relationships he had with his father, with his brother and this weird forest out of which come these old mythical figures that remind one of Robin Hood, of the Green Man, of the Paleolithic Hunter, things like that. And so things unfold from there. And Levondis is a sequel. I talked not that long ago about Grass and Raising the Stones, and I said Raising the Stones is technically a sequel, but it's only very loosely related to Grass. Here, Levondis is much more clearly connected to Mythago Wood, as in Levondis, the main character is the younger sibling of a character in Mythago Wood, and she also has to confront her relationship with Ryehope Wood and has to try and find her sibling in the wood. So these are both what I would say examples of mythic, mythical, folkloric fantasy. Now mythic more than folkloric because I mean it really touches upon like old archetypes even prehistoric ones. There's just a dash of, not science fiction as such, but sciencey elements. Because the author was a veterinarian researcher or something like that, and he started off by writing science fiction. And you can kind of see him trying to inject a bit of rationality in this weird mystical phenomena in Mythago Wood. The story is pretty straightforward. Stephen Huxley comes home from the wall and the story unfolds from there with flashbacks, him thinking about his father and his childhood, etc. In Levondis, the first part of the book is kind of a loop. You start the story and then go back to the main character, Talus's well, birth and then childhood. And then the second part of the story takes place after a time jump. But it's a weird time jump because this forest warps time and place pretty significantly as well. Otherwise it's still a pretty straightforward story with also, you know, flashbacks and trippy stuff. So writing-wise, I found Robert Holtstock's styles fairly simple and straightforward but also very raw. There's something very gritty about these books. He really goes into detailed descriptions of like bodily processes, being in the forest close to the earth, encountering beasts and, well, these mythical figures, these mythagos, which hark back to, you know, um, the Middle Ages or even uh, before that, the Bronze Age, the Iron Age, uh, the prehistoric era. So men who are dirty and smell a lot. There's a strong emphasis on smell in these books. That was fairly different. I actually like that. <laughs> he took the time to re-describe what people smelled like and what the forest smelled like, the earth, the animals, the sweat. And yeah, there's something very raw, gritty, brutal in a way, but not necessarily in like 
a torture porn way. It doesn't go overboard into violence or anything like that. It's just very close to the earth, close to our more primitive past. I liked it. It was different. Though it did remind me just a tad of some of the descriptions and some of the narrative elements in The Mists of Avalon and also The Warlord Chronicles by Bernard Cornwell, which is his reinterpretation of the Arthurian legend, but like placed in a historical context of like post-Roman Britain, because he's a historical fiction writer. Especially when it came to like the pagan elements, because obviously you have these mythical figures that go back to the Roman Age, the Celtic Age, the Paleolithic Age, so those people were pagan and animistic and shamanistic. And a lot of that, a lot of the rituals done, the way these people lived, those elements were treated in a similar fashion as the way they're treated in the Warlord Chronicles and the Mists of Avalon. It's not negative, but it's raw. It's honest. <laughs> semi-brutal way. It's not demonizing or even judgmental, it's just bleh. Take it or leave it. And then next to that I also appreciated the descriptions of nature without the specific gritty aspects involved. Describing the wood, the sounds of birds and the trees, the leaves shifting in the wind, and also just the English countryside. That was nice. It was very well done, very well realized. And that being said, it's not, like I said, it's fairly straightforward language, but it, it grips you, it punches you in the gut in a way because it's so raw. Raw is really the best word I have for it. His style is raw, but also great at describing nature overall and those more primitive humans. I thought the overall characterization of the main protagonists, Stephen Huxley in The Thargo Wood and Talis Keaton in Levondis, was decent, satisfactory, good. I mean, in a way, I think the focus was placed more on the quest these characters go on and on their bonds to their family members than on the inner development of any of those two characters. Which worked fine for those novels. It didn't really need to focus specifically on the inner life of Stephen Huxley or Talis Keaton. I mean, you do have that as well. Like I said, the characterization is decent, but I don't think that's the most interesting aspect. In a way, too, since one of the main characteristics of these stories is this idea of the Mythago, the manifested archetype of the collective unconscious. Well, those characters kind of became themselves archetypes in a way. They became mythical figures within their own quests and within the narrative. I won't say more than that because I don't want to spoil it. So that was interesting. So also that means you don't really need to go that deeply into characterization. And so I said that there's a close look at family dynamics. Family is quite central to both of these stories since Stephen Huxley is facing the consequences of his father's relationship with the Rye Hope Wood and his brother's relationship with the wood and something that comes out of the wood. And Talis Keaton goes into Rye Hope Wood to find her lost brother. So those relationships are central to both narratives. I don't really need to have a specific world building section because these stories take place in our world in 1940s, 50s England. There is Rye Hope Wood, but like I said, the main premise of that wood is that it is a piece of primal forest, the forest which covered most of, well, Western Europe's surface a thousand years ago. Some pockets of that original primal forest remain, and so Rye Hope Wood is supposed to be one of these pockets. And you have this weird psychological metaphysical phenomena which manifests these human archetypes in the form of mythical human figures, but also beasts, even buildings and things like that. That's all there really is to be said about the world building as such. But it's very well done for what it is, I will say that. So jumping directly into the themes, because I think that's the most interesting part overall. The clear theme that jumps out at you is that of the archetype, the collective unconscious of 
humankind, very Jungian <laughs> in a way, but also collective memory as a result, because you wouldn't have the collective unconscious if you didn't have this idea of a collective memory that just lies latent in our brains. And so these archetypes, these mythagos, reside in each person's mind. But what's interesting is that which mythagos manifest kind of depends on the person. It's suggested that certain mythagos go with certain family lines. So it's not that universal, but it is at the same time. I think that was a bit paradoxical, but interesting nonetheless. And so the wood takes these archetypes out of a person's brain and makes them flesh and blood, or stone and wood, etc. In Levondis especially, the effect is similar to a funhouse mirror room. It just reflects itself, and you kind of start wondering, but what is real and what isn't real? Since these mythagos become flesh and wood, they interact with real people, but then real people become embroiled in the wood, in the mythical quest lines generated by the wood. So you have to wonder, but they were always meant to be part of these quest lines. It gets a bit trippy, actually, in Lavanda's. I like that. Some people might not, though, and I, I would understand why, but it gets very metaphysical and, and trippy, shamanistic. Like, the shaman idea, the shaman archetype is very present in Lavanda's. Pallas herself is kind of a shaman figure. So yeah. Where does the real person start? Where does the mythago start? Where do they end? How do they intersect? They come from human minds, but then they take on a life of their own. And like I said, mythago wood also has very trippy stuff going on with time and place. That's like a classical feature of some fantasy stories. You go into a parallel realm, and when you come back, a different amount of years have passed by. I mean, that's even more than a fantasy trope. That's a a myth trope. Like when you go to fairyland, you come back and hundreds of years have passed. So there's a bit of that going on in the space. The size of Rye Hope Wood inside is way, way bigger than on the outside. So trippy, like I said. Another theme that obviously links directly to that of a universally shared collective sub-memory. Is that a familial heritage? Because family dynamics are very important in those stories the bonds between parent and child and the bonds between siblings, especially. What do you inherit from your family? What does being tied to someone by blood actually mean? What is the value of that? An exploration of family, really. And then, finally, I'd say the good old man with and man versus nature, because it takes a look at our beginnings as modern humans. And some of the mythical quest lines within Rye Hope Wood have to do with the struggle for human survival in the hostile environment of the Ice Age and then the Wild Wood. So there's a lot of that going on, but also people living off the land, you know, early hunters and pagans with their rites, rituals, and territory disputes, and things like that. Oh, and of course, I forgot to add that, since it looks at archetypes, it also takes a look at how myths are born, how legends are born, and by extension, how religions are born. And that's interesting because there is a theory I've heard of that says that a lot of the legends we have as humans actually derive from real historical events that were then mythified. So, well, King Arthur is theorized to have been based on like a British warlord, but even like gods and things like that might have been based on a real person that was then deified or had extraordinary life events and things like that. I do not personally think all of it can be explained that way, but it's an interesting theory and these books kind of take it and run with it. You see these events in the deep, deep past and then they become mythified. And then you see different iterations across the ages because some of the characters analyze the mythagos they encounter in Rye Hope Wood and say, well, this is this epoch's version of the Robin Hood figure, the Green Man figure, the Old Crone figure. And so you see all the iterations and the evolution of these mythical figures, which I thought was very interesting. There is quite a bit of depth, especially in Levondis. It really digs deep into this idea of collective human memory, of archetypes, of figure of myth, of religion, of how human beings developed 
their spiritual systems, their relationship with nature, the numinous or the perceived numinous. There's quite a bit there. And it does get a bit trippy in Lavondis. But personally, I like that because I've read a lot about shamanism. I've read about psychedelic medicine and things like that, spirituality. So it fits in perfectly <laughs> in my previously existing knowledge base. But I can understand that would not appeal to everyone. But if you like mythical fantasy and looking at folklore and anthropology and things like that, I would strongly suggest you check these out. So yeah, I thoroughly enjoyed these novels. I do think Levonis is superior to Mythago Wood, if only because of the elements the author chose to focus on. In Mythago Wood there is this quest that involves getting a woman from the point of view of two dudes, um, which isn't bad <laughs> by any means, but was less interesting to me. Whereas in Levonis, the main character Talus, you see her throughout her entire life basically, and it's her quest which is familial, motivated by love, but also by spirituality in a way, or creativity, this link she has to Rye Hope Wood, and she becomes kind of a shaman and it really goes deep into the myth emergence. It takes what is in Mythago Wood and just goes deeper with it. Before I wrap up, I will read some quotes from both those novels. No wonder the aura of the woodland was so charged with a sense of solitude. An infectious loneliness that had come to inhabit the body of my father, and then Christian, and which was even now crawling through my own tissues, and would trap me if I allowed it. It was a world of mind and earth, a realm outside of real laws of space and time, a giant world, with room enough for a thousand such girls, each the product of a human mind, drawn from the towns and villages around the estate where Ryehope Wood grew. But the myth of the outsider was still terrifying, and the sheer anxiety of encompassing the unknown was a persistent and deep-rooted concern. And besides, that's Lavonda's beyond fire. Turn a knock, dear Stephen, Avalon, heaven, call it what you like. It's the unknown land, the beginning of the labyrinth, the place of mystery, the realm guarded not against man but against man's curiosity, the inaccessible place, the unknowable forgotten past. As I believe I've said to you before, the gift is not what you hear or learn. The gift is being able to hear and learn. These things are yours from the moment they come and you can shape the tune, or the clay, or the painting, or whatever it is, because it belongs to you. All things are known, Talus, but most things are forgotten. It takes a special magic to remember them. They could have come from any place in any time, from the fairy lands of old, from the earth before humankind, from the dreams of a young girl who was now finding, in their dun-coloured bodies, a beauty that went beyond the animal in them into the realm of the magic that they countenanced. There was no such thing as a mother's kiss. It was a kiss for all things, a son's kiss too. It signalled the rightness of a deed. It signalled acceptance. It signalled love that goes beyond the love of a kiss. And that was my review for Mythago Wood and Lavondis by Robert Holstock. Like I said, it is a series that has five or six books in it total. I'm not going to bother reading the rest of it. I'm happy with what I read in the Fantasy Masterworks collection. Please let me know if you've read these books. Did you enjoy them? Did you not? Let's discuss. In the meantime, I hope you'll have a lovely day, evening, afternoon, whichever, and I shall see you in the next video. Bye-bye.